Thank you, Juliana, and, and a very warm welcome to everybody to this afternoon's or this morning's, wherever you are, webinar. Uh, very excited to have a, a great session ahead of us with some very interesting speakers. So grateful for them joining us as well. Um, I would just quickly like to introduce myself. Uh, I'm Michael Alexander from Diageo. Uh, I'm also the vice chairman of the Wash for Work initiative and um, we'll hear more about that in due course. But it's a delight to hear today. I'm really grateful for everybody for joining. Uh, I think we're gonna have a really interesting uh, session, really encourage everybody to get involved and ask lots of questions in the chat function. Um, this is the, a webinar, Rebuilding Through Collective Action on Water and Hygiene, a practical guide for wash experts and business leaders. So it's a combination of some tools and frameworks to help uh, businesses step up to the challenge of uh, hygiene and also hearing from two companies directly on how they've done that and how they're working together and leveraging uh, collective action to have more impact uh, for the benefit of wash and particularly hygiene. So it's fantastic to be to be here today. Thank you very much for joining. And a, uh, I'd just like to stress that this is a, a joint uh, a joint webinar, I suppose, between Wash for Work, uh, the Water Resilience Coalition, and Water Aid. So again, we're practicing what we're preaching. Uh, we're collaborating on this webinar, and it's great to have everybody on. So next slide, please. A quick reminder, it was back in, I think it was May, yeah, May that we had our first uh, webinar for the Wash for Work, uh, where we provided some specific resources and we launched the, the uh, COVID page of the Wash for Work initiative and we launched the WBCSD pledge, which I hope everybody's had a look at, certainly businesses should be having a look at if they can. Uh, and we were delighted with the success of this. And we'll hear now, if you could move on to the next slide, please. Uh, we'll hear now, a more focused um, uh, webinar looking at basically uh, three items. So as I said, this is mixing uh, the framework and tools to support companies to deliver on the ground and then hear from companies directly uh, what you know, can be done and how they're acting. A, a, br a brief pause perhaps and just re reflect um, before we go into the detail of the objectives. You know, I think ultimately we're, we're recognizing here that you know, business has a role to play in addressing uh, and addressing and combating the spread of COVID-19 and that it's having a big impact on business and communities and economies. It's probably stated in the obvious, but you know, often we're turning to governments to, to, to be the deliverer of all the solutions. I think the business needs to recognize its responsibilities and needs to recognize that needs to be part of the solution, working with others, working with governments, working collaboratively and using the tools available. So hopefully this brings to light the opportunities to do that and we're grateful for everybody joining. Uh, if we're just going to some of the key objectives here, we're looking at the, the importance of the uh, business action on WASH, as we've said, and how companies can take actions in the operations, supply chains and communities. We're just going to share some examples uh, of collective action on WASH and we're going to leverage these business practices and engage business champions to mobilize others. So hopefully at the end of this session, uh, many will feel uh, energized and motivated to do more and that would be a big success so thank you we're going to provide practical guidance and inspiring examples so next slide please so as i said at the outset we've got some great speakers here i'm really pleased to have everybody on board and it's going to be a quick and punchy session where everybody's talking just more for five minutes six minutes perhaps and then we're going to leave plenty of time for q a at the end so just very quickly, we've got firstly, Peter Schulte from the uh, CEO Waterman at the Pacific Institute. He's a senior digital engagement associate. We've then got Om Gutam, who is the wash manager at uh, WaterAid. Uh, so welcome both of you. Then from a business perspective, we've got Saswat Rath from uh, Gap Inc, who is senior manager on global sustainability. And we've got Kim Faulkner, who's VP for supply chain for Latin America for Colgate Palmolive. So, Really appreciate the speakers taking the time out today to uh, join this webinar and share, and share their experiences. So we're going to the next slide, please. The first section here of the, of the webinar is gonna be focused around the framework and the tools. Uh, so this is about water and the COVID-19 pandemic, a business framework for water and COVID-19. So hopefully over the next 10 minutes, you'll get a good insight into uh, the, how this tool can help businesses and with that, I'm going to hand over to Peter to get us started. Thank you, Peter. 
Thanks, Michael. And, and thanks everyone for being here and taking your time today. Um, next slide, we can even skip this one, uh, this slide. Um, so thanks, I'm Peter Schulte. I'm from the Pacific Institute, which is a water sustainability think tank um, based in Oakland, California. Um, also representing the CEO water mandate. Um, the mandate is a UN Global Compact initiative that uh, garners commitments from companies around the world on water stewardship um, and then builds tools and resources and, and other actions that can help companies realize those commitments. Um, the Pacific Institute has been co-secretariat for the mandate for the last 12 or 13 years. So, you know, something like 95% of my work is, um, is for the mandate specifically. Um, I wanted to talk today um, about a, a resource we came up with in the last several months um, with WaterAid um, called the Business Framework for, for COVID and, and Water. Um, let's see, are we on the right side here? Yeah, um, I think um, it, in February and March, as it became clear how big of a challenge COVID-19 is, um, I think it was widely understood by many that it COVID-19 is a drinking water sanitation and hygiene challenge. Um, pre uh, preventing the transmission of the disease really requires proper hand washing. Hand washing often requires clean, accessible water. Um, and yet millions of people around the world don't have access to basic hand washing services and, and billions of people live in water stressed regions. So I, I think it was clear that there was a, a major issue there and a lot of work to be done among the water and wash communities. Um, next slide. I think what was was perhaps less obvious um, was that businesses have a critical role to play in this, not only in responding to COVID generally, um, but in the water and hand washing um, aspects of it specifically. Um, so they can help prevent the transmission of the virus by um, at their operations and by communicating um, with folks. Um, they can help rebuild the economy um, and they can help prevent and mitigate um, future shock events like a pandemic or a natural disaster or anything kind of like that. Um, but, but at the mandate and, and elsewhere, you know, we, we've sensed that the roles businesses can play in this hadn't been clearly articulated. Um, and that's really the impetus for this project. Uh, so next slide. Um, so this business framework for water and COVID-19 and it's most, you know, it's a website. Uh, you can go to um, CEOWaterMandate.org slash COVID. Um, it's really meant to first articulate the connections between water, COVID, and business, how they're all related to one another. Um, it offers a practical framework for the actions companies can take on this. Um, and then it connects businesses to capacity building resources and examples that can really help them help them do that. Um, it's not a you know hundred page tome uh, or really technical guidance. It's really more of a high level overview to help businesses understand their role and and what they can what actions they can start considering. Next slide. So um, a few you know principles that that kind of are overarch the whole thing. Um, we felt that corporate risks and impacts and therefore their influence and responsibility on this topic um, go well beyond their fence line. Um, it's not, they have much more to do beyond just what happens within their operations or their offices um, from the communities in which they operate uh, to their supply chains and, and so forth. Um, secondly, you know, a lot has been made, I think, around um, how economic recovery and uh, climate actions or, or green economy go hand in hand one together. And there's really a, a synergy there. Um, we felt that that is most certainly true. And also in, by the same token, economic recovery and water stewardship go hand in hand together. Um, and then lastly, um, companies can build resilience to events like this by supporting multi-stakeholder collective action and high integrity water governance around the world. And, the, and really they can't do so without, without supporting those, those processes. So next slide, please. So here's just a, I'm just gonna be really brief about this, but this is a, 
kind of high level depiction of the framework, you'll see it's really divided into three phases. Um, the first, which I would argue is what we're still in, is um, containing the pandemic. So businesses reopening in a way that's safe um, and doing what they can to contain the virus as it's still very much um, alive. So um, Dr. Gotam will go into more details about that, um, but that includes assessing their operations, um, restoring water flow to previously closed facilities, um, providing trainings to employees, investing in hand washing facilities, um, and, and a, a wide range of other actions. I don't want to go too much into those now. Um, but we also felt that you know, it was important to note that that um, building resilience and, and responding to COVID-19 is going to go beyond that. The next phase, which perhaps we've even started even as we're still in phase one, is building back the economy. And we feel strongly, as I mentioned, that we can do that in a way that builds back the economy and also helps advance our stewardship goals. And those, those are syner synergistic with one another. And then lastly, um, catalyzing a water resilient society. Um, so even potentially years from now, once the economy is built back and we're feeling good, we still want to prepare for and prevent future crisis, crises like a pandemic or those associated with the climate crisis or, or, or anything you could think of. So the third phase is really that big picture thinking of how do we create a society that's, that's resilient to challenges with respect to, to our water systems. Um, and, and, and that really connects in with uh, the Water Resilience Coalition, which the mandate has launched um, this year. Um, so next slide, please. Um, I'll, I'll skip over this one. I think Dr. Gautam can, can cover the details here. Um, but the, the framework does co cover a lot of specific actions and guidance and, and offers examples. I think the last thing I'd say in closing is just a reminder again, um, this is available for free for anyone in the world at ceowatermandate.org slash COVID. Um, and I wanted to note that we've really released more detailed elements of just phase one. Um, and phase two and phase three um, will be released in the coming weeks um, as we build that out. Um, but with that, I'll, I'll hand it over and just thank you all so much for, for being here. Thanks very much, Peter. That's an excellent start. Thank you for that. And now moving swiftly on, I'll, I'll hand over to Om now. Thank you, Om. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, hi, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are. Today, I'm uh, very much delighted to represent Waterweight and also very pleased to work together and offer our uh, insight into a framework for water and COVID-19. Waterweight uh, is part of our COVID-19 response. We are currently operating in 26 countries, targeting 99 million population. And we are focusing on households, um, schools, healthcare facilities, communities, business, uh, workplace, uh, and, and many areas. Um, of course, business sector is one of those sectors heavily impacted with COVID-19, as we are in other sector, everyone impacted. But the business community has a can actually really play a key vital role in responding to COVID-19, um, as well as also rebuilding economy and preventing current and future pandemic. And I'm sure some of the, the practical tips um, highlighted as part of this business framework is going to have some impact in terms of how we position water sanitation and hygiene, more importantly, hygiene in um, uh, workplace so that we can avoid the cross-contamination and make a more resilient uh, business work. Next slide, please. So in my presentation today, um, I'm going to highlight the key step, the, the practical steps proposed on the phase one as previously highlighted. Um, this is important because many business actors now trying to reopen their work. Um, if hygiene conditions are not conducive, if wash facilities are not there, if workers are not adhering and practicing key hygiene behaviors, those workplaces can be an epicenter in terms of transmitting disease, transmitting virus. We really want to avoid this. So therefore, as a, the first and critical steps within this framework, are to implement a concrete action. That concrete action includes conducting self-assessment. Ideally, in any behavior change work, 
we do a formative research in order to understand what are the determinants, what motivates people, what are the behaviors, what these facilities are. But this is very difficult to do in this particular uh, context. At the same time, we really want to make it very light and efficient process for business community. So therefore, one of the key components included into this framework is the first step is to conducting a self-assessment. The self-assessment is to really understand the key risk point for contamination. So that means we would like to use our hazard analysis and critical control point methods. These methods is actually used in food safety area. The whole idea here is to understand the critical control points. When you understand the critical control points, we can actually apply a critical measures to, to those points. So that means the critical measures will be those behaviors that need to be added or practiced in those points. For example, in the right hand side, you can see a picture. This is a pre-COVID scenario in one of the ready-made garment factories in Bangladesh. People are actually eating lunch at this particular uh, locations. This might be a, one of the critical control points. In COVID scenario, you cannot do this. It's because you need to maintain physical distancing, you need to have investing facilities in place with cues and nudges. So uh, understanding these points within the settings is quite vital. So therefore, therefore, one of the critical steps to understand these critical points, at the same time, it is important to understand what motivates the, the workers to actually practice the behavior. What are the barriers currently? Understanding all of these is quite vital. When it comes to assessment, often we think, oh, this is complex undertaking. It does need a skill set, a research skill set. Therefore, we are very much conscious and try to offer more practical tools. The, the good news here is currently we are developing a risk assessment tool uh, as part of the WSC and Water Aid campaign, the Water is Resilience Initiatives. So these tools is going to be available within next week. So you'll have some opportunity actually test it and use it. The second point, uh, as alluded previously, um, the um, some of, during the lock, I mean during lockdown period, I think in, in many countries is still the case. The uh, some of the facilities are actually blocked or stopped, right? So it is important that now we safely and efficiently restore some of those facilities, sanitation facilities, the water flow system. If we don't do that, it might pose a public health risk to the people. For example, if we stop water for the last two months, if we again going to reopen it, we need to test it, we need to make sure that the stagnant water is not there. At the same time, the, the already available facilities need to be tested before the, the workers start working. Uh, next slide, please. The, the third point, um, uh, here, the third um, uh, key elements uh, in this framework is to understand um, it, we have the right package in it. So we are really thinking um, for the business sector, there should be a two different packets. One, the package that is important for the management to understand the importance of WAS. What are the active ingredients of WAS that need to be in any workplace? So really giving that opportunity for the management, the staffs, uh, to understand the importance of water sanitation and hygiene in workplace, the, the package for the, and the, the management. The second, we need to have the hygiene behavior change package that helps to change the behavior of the workers. And that package really need to include multiple behaviors, including hand washing with soap, wearing a mask, and other. So, um, so that package, the hygiene behavior change package need to be based on the, the rapid assessment that we'll be conducting. The good news again here is we are currently developing a capacity building package for the management in order to bring that, that level of understanding what is needed, where it is needed, and what is the importance of was in those workplaces. But the, the little caveat here is we cannot design the behavior change intervention without conducting the assessment. The behavior change package then subsequently uh, designed. For that one, business sector can actually collaborate with the local NGOs. Uh, of course, Water is one of them will be happy to also support uh, where needed. The fourth point is really understanding and building those facilities in critical locations. It is important that in order to add our behavior, practice behavior, the hand washing facilities, the water need to be available everywhere. So we need to ensure, as, as a business actor, we need to ensure that those facilities are available in critical locations. The, the facilities are consistently available over time. Soap is available. It is important to ensure those. At the same time, we need to use promotional materials to have cues so that people remember those. And at the same time, we also need to be mindful that business uh, sector may, might vary. Like right? maybe in Kenya, we had tea plantation. In, in Bangladesh, maybe in garment factory. Or uh, in India, might be in tanneries. Same package is not going to be applied. 
So it is therefore we need to understand that the, the, the assessment coming from the, the uh, early assessment will actually inform the packets. So the that package will be helpful to actually um, motivate people, the workers, uh, where to fix, where to build these facilities and how to change behavior. Next slide, please. One of the examples that I, I would like to show you, while building all of these facilities, it is critical that we build these facilities in critical location. Two critical examples here. In left hand side, you can see uh, workers washing their hands before entering to the workplace. In the right hand side, you can see uh, hand washing facilities into canteen area within the factory. So it is important to identify these locations ahead of the uh, the, um, uh, the the the, um, uh, the implementation so that actually these facilities are actually built in a critical location only facility doesn't mean that workers will actually implement or practice the behavior it is important to have visual cues not just reminders as you can see in the left hand side picture on top of the hand washing facility there are cues attached with each of those uh, facilities so we need to make sure that those are available to reinforce the behavior next slide please the, my final slide uh, which is a uh, point number five and six. The point number five is, of course, the business sector will have greater ability to implement training and also build facilities and develop protocol, encourage behaviors um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a business uh, section, right? So within, within the facilities. But we also need to encourage these practices across communities and supplies because the workers work in the afternoon into the business uh, forum and then they travel to home. They can bring or they can also cross contaminate, cross transmit disease. So that's why it is important when we offer these um, uh, packages or promote, it is important we offer those promotional materials, maybe visual cues, nudges and reminders to practice those behavior at household level so that the, the, the workers continuously remember and constantly reinforce those behavior. At the same time, supplier can actually invest on facilities and implement proper hand washing um, facilities and so forth. The final point here, it is important to note that all of us, including business sector, will be operating in a new normal scenario. So of course COVID has, um, we, within new normal scenarios, since we don't know the vaccine, when the vaccine is going to be available, even if vaccine is going to be available, we don't know it is whether it is going to be 100% efficacious. The importance of was is still remain critical, not only to COVID, but also for other disease. So therefore, it is important to now uh, for us, for all of us to think that in any case, was is important. It has to be there in our um, uh, business sector. That is one. The second, COVID-19, of course, devastating effect, but at the same time, it also offers an opportunity. For, is, for a small business actor, it may not be applied for everyone, but for a small uh, business sector that are more, uh, more resilient to a specific work might be converted into developing a behavioral products, for instance. Maybe breweries or um, the, the chemical factories can produce sanitizer. Soap companies who are already producing soap might also accelerate their, uh, their business. This is an opportunity to, to make those facilities more available. But at the same time, this, um, the COVID-19 actually opened an opportunity to interact with the development sector and private sector very closely. And the importance of public-private partnership is, is, is highlighted more than ever. So therefore, it also opens uh, the whole community, the private sector, the public sector, and the government working together to have a COVID sensitive and um, uh, resilience business workplace. And um, it has opened a lot. I think for what rate as we are implementing um, uh, our program in, in Kenya and uh, Tanzania and Bangladesh and India, we are making actually our ongoing um, uh, response more uh, COVID sensitive in those uh, areas in, in, in workplace. At the same time, I have seen many private sector um, uh, came on board and he started investing on, on, on hygiene. Uh, for example, the, the latest, um, uh, the, the evidence will be the coalition between um, uh, FCDO, the, which previously known as DFID, and Unilever. They are now implementing a, a hygiene behavior sense coalition initiatives uh, with 100 million um, uh, uh, pounds and operating in 31 countries. Is it, is it really demonstrate the, the collaboration between different actors? So what I would like to conclude here uh, for this particular point is, is it an opportunity for us to work together collaboratively and collectively so that we can ensure a very um, a COVID sensitive and business resilience workplace? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. That's great. That's very, very important points uh, and appreciate that. Now, very quickly, um, like all good events, we've got a guest star quickly. Uh, 
Uh, joining us today, a uh, non advertised guest star, Ruth Roma, is going to quickly uh, brief us on a new hygiene protocol. So, Ruth, over to you. Great. Thanks very much, Michael. Hi, everybody. Um, so, this is a great opportunity to highlight a new um, product that Wash for Work has developed. Um, we will be launching it early next week. And it actually directly responds to the question that just came in from Ulrika from Coca-Cola about where is the guidance on, on some of this. So it's the hand hygiene protocol for the workplace. Um, so if we move on to the next slide. Um, so a bit of context to this, there's already a wealth and depth of, depth of knowledge and experience on hand hygiene in the workplace, but it's sometimes buried within other documents or, or kind of um, different resources. So the objective of this two pager is to consolidate and make it very simple in terms of some recommendations and best practice, very much focused around hand hygiene in the workplace in the context of COVID. So it's very kind of singularly focused and should provide some very practical resource for, for, for businesses. So just to highlight very briefly on um, what it covers. So in terms of access, um, um, talking about access to facilities in the right numbers, in the right ratios of female to male, for example, um, it talks about the types of facilities that should be in place, what types of elements need to be considered in terms of um, number of pe just people that are disabled, for example, that might be in the workplace, um, and also what should be in place. And then finally, it provides some good practice um, guidance around good hand hygiene. And then it finishes with a call to action. So there's three clear call to actions within this um, two, two pager. First of all is inclusion. So we want this to be included within existing standards and certification. Um, so not reinventing the wheel, we want to try and embed it with, with what's already there. Um, we want to try and encourage companies to use this protocol within their workplaces and also encourage companies to then also think about signing the WASH pledge. And then finally, we want partners on this call um, in the WRC, in the CO Water Mandate and the WASH for Work community to share this within their networks. So as I said, we'll be launching it next week. Um, it's a WASH for Work resource and, and hopefully um, it's not um, reinventing anything new. It's nothing new. It's just providing it in a simple, consolidated manner. So thanks very much, Michael. Back to you. Thank you, Ruth. It's great to have these in one place and everything brought together in a business friendly way. So I really appreciate that. Thank you for the work for WaterAid and, and the water mandate on that. So changing tact now, we're going to hear from the grassroots, as it were, from businesses on the ground. Uh, before I introduce uh, Saswa, I was just going to briefly uh, raise uh, the options for questions on the chat function, please. So please, we've had one or two already, so please do fire in your questions into the chat function and we'll try and spend 10-15 minutes at the end if we can uh, managing those. So um, please, please, please uh, uh, submit any questions you have. So now quickly over to Saswat who from GAP and we look forward to hearing from a bit of, uh, as I say, some experience from the, from the ground. Thanks, Michael. Uh, yes, 2020, what a year it has been for all of us. Uh, no matter what we have been doing in business, uh, not in business, it has affected everyone. COVID-19, if nothing, has brought hand washing in the top of the uh, priority in the agenda for everyone. Um, one, one thing, one basic thing for hand washing is, uh, is availability of water. And uh, do we have uh, water available in our supply chain? Uh, we could very well say yes and no to that. Uh, you know, probably we work in supply chain and like uh, the previous speakers, uh, you know, it's easier to work in your supply chain directly uh, in terms of availability of water in the factories or mills or the vendors that you work with. Uh, but what happens is, uh, you know, you have got workers who are working in these facilities and in the non-working hours, they're actually going back to their communities. And if you're having water in your factories, but not in the community, that, that defeats the entire purpose. So you should have interventions both within your fence and outside your fence to have an ecosystem approach to, to address uh, this issue. Uh, we in Gap Inc. have our water strategies, which is uh, looking into both inside the fence and outside the fence. Uh, Let's talk a bit about uh, inside the fence in the factories and the mills uh, that we are working. A uh, few things that we are doing is uh, assessment and remediation work, where we, we even prior to COVID situation, we had, uh, we had this going where we used to check around the 
the availability of wash, water, sanitation facility, all the hygiene, uh, soaps and everything uh, in, in the, in the uh, vendors' facilities. Um, now with the COVID situation, uh, we are, we are being, be, being more strict on, on those. Uh, we are pushing our vendors to ensure that it's, it's available out there for, uh, for the workers uh, and for every, anyone who is working in, in these uh, facilities. Um, beyond this, uh, you know, once water is available, the other thing is uh, actually the behavior. You know, uh, Dr. Ohm actually uh, spoke a bit about the behavior uh, aspect of it. So behavior is important. You need to you know, inculcate the right behavior. People should know when to wash hands and so on. So you know, the, uh, the IAC materials are important. But along with that, what we have is um, a, a flagship program called Gapping Pace Program uh, for capacity building of women uh, in, in facilities and communities. Uh, so we are creating champions in, uh, among the women uh, in, the, in the factories uh, where we teach them the soft skills, but also WASH. WASH is one of the modules in, in PACE uh, curriculum. And you know, th this is a very good bridge between community and, and, uh, and the facilities where these women, when they go back to their community, they have built an agency where they could also influence the community around them to, to uh, practice the right behavior uh, in, in such a uh, pandemic situation. Uh, some other work that we do is uh, we're proud to be associated with WaterAid, uh, where we are working around uh, strengthening the business case for WASH uh, in, in one of the facilities where we are trying to uh, generate a ROI. Uh, this, is, this is important for, for businesses to understand uh, you know, the, uh, the, the return on investment that you get by investing on WASH. This is probably a long-term strategy for, for the entire business community as a whole. So uh, very proud to be associated with uh, water on that. Uh, also, we are uh, working, we have been working uh, a lot around uh, uh, resource efficiency, uh, around uh, our manufacturing, uh, where we are trying to be water efficient in our uh, manufacturing. We are working on various innovations uh, on that. Uh, these are some of the work that we are doing within defense. Now there are work that we do even outside defense uh, in the communities. So we have, uh, we have partnered with uh, USAID uh, and uh, with uh, various NGOs, WaterAid is one of them, uh, CARE, uh, Institute of Sustainable Community, water.org, uh, ICRW, I4DI. Uh, so we are, we are partnering with them to work in the communities uh, around our, our mills in, in the farming, cotton farming communities where uh, you know, we're working towards water availability, accessibility, water quality. Uh, we are working uh, towards water governance. Uh, we are working towards creating water champions, peace champions in the community who could take the work forward and actually uh, create a ripple effect in the, in the community. Uh, and uh, you know, we are also working towards good farming practices uh, we have water efficient farming uh, practices uh, through Women and Water Alliance program that we have uh, with, uh, with the USA. And um, the overall, you know, the, the, the point that I'm trying to uh, come to is uh, overall what each business should look at is the long-term gain out of investing in, in WASH, um, not just within defense, but their water stewardship strategy should also include outside defense and you know, have the right partnerships uh, in place. Michael? Thank you very much, that's, that's what I appreciate that and I appreciate you keeping to time, that's brilliant. So we are behind time a little bit, but it's very important to hear from Kim. Thank you very much for joining us, Kim from uh, Colgate Palmolive, over to you, thank you. Thanks, Michael. It really is a great pleasure to be here today to talk about two very important topics like water and hygiene, especially during these unprecedented time. And, and both topics are so critical to Colgate Palmolive's purpose, and that's creating a future that we can all smile about, which includes creating healthier futures for our people, their pets, uh, and our planet. Uh, and, and both topics have also been a critical component to our sustainability strategy that we've made some tremendous progress on on, on the past several years. Uh, for instance, since 2002, we've cut in half the water used to produce our products in our factory. And through our global Save Water campaign, we estimate that we have avoided the use of 150 billion gallons of water. 
Uh, it's really humbling to know that the simple behavior change of turning off the tap when you brush your teeth can really have a long lasting impact on, on water scarcity. Uh, our 2025 water stewardship strategy at Colgate um, is really built upon the foundation of, of water hygiene and, and wash. There's five pillars to that strategy. Uh, the first one is um, our engagement with 100% of our priority material suppliers that operates in water stressed regions uh, and engaging with them to help initiatives for them to drive wash campaigns and help with water scarcity. Um, a good example of this is the work we're doing with our mint farmers in the US. Uh, you can imagine how important mint is to a toothpaste company like ourselves, but also very agriculturally um, uh, concerned with water. Uh, the second is continuing the great work around uh, within our own walls. As, as Sash Wood had said, that's such an important component of industries that we operate, making sure our manufacturing footprints continue to reduce the need uh, and re reliance of, on water. Uh, and we'll continue the great work that we've progressed over the last you know, several years. But the third is, is really important. That's about adapting our products and consumer behavior to use less water, um, to make sure that we're developing products that uh, help the, the water scarcity and water crisis and not hurt it in the long run. And again, driving those behaviors, like I mentioned, turning off the tap when you brush your water to make sure that we can have uh, safe water access to those most in, in need of it. The fourth is around protecting our ecosystem. Uh, and this is where really a lot of the partnerships um, come in play. Um, and our work with the Nature Conservatory and the WRC are, are helping you know, all industries, I think, come together, um, as well as with Colgate, to, to really tackle um, conservation um, and restoration initiatives around water. And then last and certainly not least is the wash component of our water, conserve, uh, water stewardship strategy. That is such a critical pillar of the, what, the work that we are doing and need to continue over the next several years. We have pledged by 2025 to reach 1 million people with safer access to water and sanitation facilities. And I'm really proud to say that with the partnership um, with Water for People, in Guatemala, India, and Peru, we've reached about 750,000 people with safer, cleaner access to water, and almost a half a billion of people with our hygiene education. So making a, a really large progress in the areas most affected um, in water stress and, and hygiene uh, areas. We, we also are very proud that last year we reached 1.5 million people specifically with our hand washing campaigns. However, as COVID pandemic hits and we entered 2020, we realized we had to do more. Uh, and I'm really proud that we responded with this really awesome campaign. You can see here on the screen. We responded with our hashtag Safe Hands Bar Soap initiative to help amplify the World Health Organization's hashtag Safe Hands efforts. We quickly deployed and developed a branded simple bar soap that we could provide to millions of people around the world that needed so desperately access to basic hand washing products and education. Uh, we quickly orchestrated five manufacturing locations on three continents in a little over 30 days to produce 25 million of these bar soaps and have partnered with four NGOs to distribute them to 28 countries that have been most affected by, by COVID. Um, in addition, not only from this very simple hand washing uh, instructions that are printed on the back of these bars, we've amplified those hand washing education materials through uh, print, social media, and local campaigns. Um, and we've reached about, we've made about 1 billion impressions with that hand washing education so far. Uh, I think the hashtag safe hands initiative is just such a great example of how businesses like ourselves and those others need to partner together. We need to use our scale, our capabilities and our resources to just amplify and continue the great work um, that we all can do collectively.
Uh, that's why we're really excited to you know, be partnering um, with the WRC, WaterAid, and others to make sure we can continue this, this important uh, work and help spread the, um, help make sure we don't spread the COVID virus any more than it has. Uh, so really happy to, to be uh, a part of this and, and thank you. Back to you, Michael. Thank you very much, Kim. That's fantastic. That's really good to hear what's been happening on the ground with Kogo Pomolov. Thank you very much for that. So I've slightly set myself up for uh, a stressful point here in terms of I asked for lots of questions and I got lots of questions. And, and that means I've got to kind of go through the chat function and pick them out, which is a great uh, task to have. But we did have some pre-prepared questions. We'll skip those for the moment and go to the audience questions uh, on the chat function first. And then perhaps we can uh, go back to some of the pre-prepared ones if we have some time. But I'd rather respond to the audience if we can. So um, a one for you, Peter, maybe uh, here for about how we're getting businesses involved. How are you ensuring that these uh, tools are speedily made available to businesses? And how would you define success? Yeah, thanks, Michael. And thanks, Sanjeev, for the question. Um, so on how we're making this as available as possible, you know, first it's available for free for anyone in the world um, at, at ceowatermanit.org slash COVID. Um, but we've also really been leaning on um, social media to, to help amplify this. So for example, uh, the Water Resilience Coalition and WaterAid recently kind of launched the, the Water is Resilience hashtag on Twitter. Um, and this is really meant to um, use the, the, the voices of WRC members and partners and, and water aid and also other sorts of organizations to really get these messages out and make sure that people know about these connections and these tools. Um, as for defining success, uh, you know, first and foremost, um, success looks like businesses um, being able to open and operate without compromising the safety of their workers and, and their communities. Um, over the long term, I think success um, would be really raising the awareness of businesses seeing these connections. So this isn't just kind of a philanthropic thing on the side, but an issue that's that's deeply um, connected to their success as a business and and really to promote the idea of water resilience as as critical to businesses long term uh, viability and that Resilience is certainly um, preparing for and responding to climate change, but also pandemics and also any kind of number of huge shock events that we can't even foresee right now. So success for me is, is just seeing how embedded that is into business success. Thanks. Thank you, Peter, that's great. Turning to another one, this might be one for you, uh, Saswat, it's looking at the tools. And, and the question is, curious if the businesses have conducted any wash for work assessments with any of the available tools, i.e. the ILO handbook and the wash for work pledge, uh, and any follow-up evaluations that have learned from those uh, and their outcomes, pre and post evaluation. Is there anything you can share for that, Raswat, that, so Saswat, that we might have uh, done from GAP? Um. We, we, we have partners with uh, uh, Wash for Work uh, and yeah, uh, we have Wash Pledge uh, with, uh, uh, with the CEO Water Mandate as well. Uh, unfortunately, it's, uh, our uh, sustainability report is, uh, is due to be out uh, very soon and we are, uh, we are uh, coming out with a lot of disclosure in that. So uh, if you don't mind waiting for a few more days, uh, uh, you should be able to uh, get a lot of learning uh, from there. Um, I'm extremely sorry for not being able to uh, directly tell you uh, everything uh, right now. No, that's fine. I completely appreciate you've got to keep that uh, confidential, whatever. But Kim, I might turn to you at either that question and there's, and there's a follow up question here around how can we promote the business in the wash sector and make private sectors and service providers more, more responsible? So a uh, kind of big question there, and, but it would uh, be great to have your insights. Sure, it, it is a great question. I, I really do think it comes from uh, sharing that WASH is not just a social responsibility priority, that it is a business priority. And I think, you know, making sure that private and public sectors and all that we do business with on the value chain, everything from our suppliers 
to our third party customers, to our consumers, et cetera, uh, that what's good for you know, people on the planet is also very good for business. And I think that's the first and foremost uh, thing to, to help engage and, and really drive the, the, the WASH initiatives. Thanks, Kim. The questions are coming fast and furious here. So I'm going to uh, turn to you, Om, if I can. Uh, I've got one here around a kind of broader question in terms of behavior. And the question is, as you provide WASH hygiene education, training and advice for management workers and the communities, would it be advantageous and more effective to include other COVID preventive behaviors in a consolidated package, e.g. masks and social workplace distancing? And I know that's something that's been front of mind for water aid as they kind of consolidated that. So your perspective on that would be really helpful. Thank you. Absolutely critical. Yeah, it is important to understand how viruses can mean to prevent those critical pathways. Addressing only one behavior will not have the, the huge impact. So we don't want to miss any of these opportunities. So since the beginning of this pandemic, understanding what are the, the pathways through which the virus is transmitting, what it made a decision. At the same time, there are global um, organizations like WHO and, and others also advocating the multiple behaviors to be promoted. So it is critical that we promote hand washing with soap as one of the critical um, behaviors, but at the same time, wearing a mask, maintaining physical distancing and, and um, uh, cleaning of frequently tossed surface. Those are four behaviors that are quite vital. Of course, there are some um, uh, barriers. You, you may not have like opportunity to maintain physical distancing everywhere. At that point of time, you can wear a, the face mask. But at the same time, what is important to note that I think uh, the, the questions really puts on the on the hygiene education. That is something that I really want you to address as well. If uh, Michael, if you allow me. Um, the one thing that we are aware, based on our experience working into the sector for so many years, the educating people is not going to change any behaviors. People are already, majority of the people are already aware that they should be washing their hands, right? So therefore, the printing posters, leaflets, telling people do this and that, wasting lots of money on caps and t-shirts is not going to work, not going to change anyone's behavior. At the same time, the, the, the COVID-19 creating a fear to everyone like using germ and health messaging is not going to work. Fear is a temporary stimulus. People might rush to buy the product now, but afterwards, what happens? Because we have seen during COVID, uh, the cholera outbreak and Ebola outbreak. So therefore, what works is basically understanding the people's emotions and making sure that those behavioral products and cues and noises are in behavioral place. So let's not focus on educating people. Let's focus on behavior change through emotions. Let's make sure that those facilities are available with cues and noises. And I'm sure working with the private sector because you know how to sell your product. You, you do a very marketing, social marketing approach. Can we do the similar approach, branding and creating an inspirational package for behavior change so that we can sell these, these ideas, these emotions in order to change the behavior that sticks in people's mind. I think this opportunity, uh, working with the private sector, really making this the inspirational campaign in terms of innovating product and, and the package is, is, is quite as well. Thank you, over. Thank you, Om. That's very helpful. Uh, and I'm going to turn back to our, our private sector colleagues and ask a, a very interesting question that's come in. What has been the most challenging issues in getting WASH at Workplace implemented? And uh, I might turn to Saswat first and then to Kim. But first, Saswat, what's the most challenging issues you've faced with WASH for, uh, the WASH at Workplace pledge implementation? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, see, uh, many of the vendors that you work with, uh, they have a competing priority right now is... Uh, to get the business out, we have lost a lot of business due to COVID and now they have to catch up uh, with, the, with their business priority. But at the same time, they have to look into the health and well-being uh, of, of their, their workers. Uh, now, they might look at it from, from the short-term gain. Uh, we have to move them from the ideology of having this as a short-term gain to actually keeping it uh, or bringing it more as their business strategy to move them towards WASH. So, uh, you know, the, the, the work that we do with our vendors is actually to move them from saying that, hey, just fix a tap and get water in there to saying that, now build it in your strategy. How are you going to have a long-term availability of water? How, how can you create the long-term behavior among your workers around hand washing and hygiene? So, you know, making that shift is, uh, is a, bit, uh, a bit tricky because uh, you need commitment from their top management. You need uh, commitment from from workers uh, and from the operation managers and so on. So I think that is one of the critical challenges that you you'd face, uh, uh, 
uh, during this phase. Thanks, and I'd love to hear from you, Kim, uh, any experiences that you have. Sure, and, and I can share specifically in, in some of the challenges, but really I think there are more opportunities, especially in, in, Latin, in Latin America, as many of you know how much has been hit by, by COVID. I, I think what we have found the biggest you know, challenge, like I said, is the opportunity. It's what Peter and Dr. Ohm had said that while in the workplace, uh, it's been, I wouldn't say easy, but, but a little bit uh, easier to really implement a lot of protocols and, and initiatives. But the real challenge is outside of, of businesses four walls. And, and that's really where the big difference can be made. And, and we learned that quite a bit uh, in Latin America and with our supply chains that we needed to make sure the messages were very much looking at beyond an employee, but their families and taking that education at home uh, we've been using our hand washing education and Zoom calls on Sunday nights with families of employees to help, um, you know, engage that. And that has been actually a best practice that our customers uh, and some of our suppliers are, are starting to use. So, and I think that's really where the, the huge benefit of the WASH uh, programs come into play. Thanks, Kim. That, that's fantastic. It's great to hear what's going on in the ground. So thank you for that. I'm just going to quickly turn to P Peter now with a, an interesting question around what he sees, how, how this moving forward with companies. So how do you see companies using the COVID-19 framework to enhance their water stewardship strategies and what impact could that have? So relating to COVID-19 and water stewardship. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Well, so this connects to what I was saying before. I definitely, we all hope this, you know, really starts a conversation about how connected uh, water stewardship is to to really practical business realities and to just um, embed them more within one another. But I, I don't want to belabor that point too much. I, you know, I'd, I'd also like to um, to mention, um, you know, this has been an interesting project in a way since it's all happening on the fly. So one one way companies can get involved is is to help us, you know, build it out over time on the tool. We very much are hoping to get input and and let this grow and evolve over time as we learn more about it. So not only do I hope they learn from this and start conversations, uh, but that they help us grow it and, and build it over time as their experience um, comes in. Um, the last thing I'd mention is um, we've built this in and connected it to the Mandates Water Action Hub. Um, and so you can jump off from the website to actual projects in the world where they can get, where companies and others can get involved and work with them, one another to do this. Um, so the, those are just a few things that come to mind. Thank you very much, Peter. We're just entering our last five minutes now. So any last questions on the chat function? Uh, I think I've coped with most of them, but uh, if I've missed anything or you want to repeat something or anything's not clear, please do pile in now on the chat function if you, if you want any clarifications. I'm gonna turn quickly now to Om around uh, some some reflections on how he thinks uh, businesses have responded. So, uh, um, here's the question: What are your reactions to hearing how leaders uh, are responding to the challenges of COVID in response to the workplace, supply chains, and the communities in which they work? And are there any lessons? So, how, what do you, what do you what's your honest opinion on the response so far? So, yeah, thank you very much. It's a, it's a great question. I think my my um, honest feedback would be, of course, the business sector heavily impacted. Uh, and has a devastating effect. Um, some kind of caution is there, but I think in few uh, few business sector really is is not not that is is advantage, but it is a, because they invest on this sector already, like uh, the soap companies and others, right? So they they were they were they were actually already into the mission. So therefore, what what I see is one of the biggest opportunity here. Of course, there are there are laws and, and so forth. The business sector really contribute, and we should collectively do is thinking big and acting big. This is the time um, we should definitely think for changing behavior for a generation at a massive scale. Um, so without public-private partnership and without collective effort, this is not going to be possible. So I have seen some of the large scale effort. 
I have never seen like the, the behavior change component, was component, um, the prioritize in, in, in such a massive scale. So this is something fantastic happening. I have seen the, the different coalition happening. For example, the, the, um, the behavior change, the coalition initiatives between uh, FCDU and Unilever, which I mentioned. There is an initiative called Hanaijin Fall Initiative led by WH UNICEF and Water is also one of the core partners as well. They are urging government to, to have a, um, the country roadmap. And the business sector can hugely play a role in terms of bringing investment in it in terms of driving the social marketing driven and the, the behavior change approach and really product innovation um, um yeah so i think i have seen like so many small scale product innovation happening bringing like uh, the the water efficiency hand washing station for example so we can really deepen and and have a foster long-term partnership um, in order to um, one to prevent current uh, pandemic and also to uh, maybe prevent future possible pandemic Thank you. Thank you. I mean, that's so important, isn't it? That bit about innovation. So I really appreciate that. And we hadn't really touched on that so much in terms of delivery. So uh, I'm just going to save the final question to Kim here in terms of looking forward and, and looking at this theme of collective action. And we are working together on this webinar with uh, the Water Resilience Coalition and uh, Water Aid and their campaign around water is resilience. And, so, so your views quickly, Kim, on how can collective action through the Water Resilience Coalition's Water is Resilience campaign help complement these efforts? Yeah, great question. I think what we, you know, at, at Colgate especially have realized that though we are a brand that is in more households than any other uh, around the world, and that allows us to very quickly get messaging and, and connection with consumers, we really realized that, that that's not enough. And if we didn't have partnerships through the WRC, the great credibility of water aid, we wouldn't be able to accomplish what we set out to do. And I think purely that is the importance between business, um, you know, private and public sector to really partner partnership to accelerate these, uh, these critical initiatives. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And uh, that's such an important message to, to end with. So. I think I'm going to just call it a day because uh, we're one minute away from the end of our hour. So I just wanted to finish by firstly thanking all the panelists. I appreciate giving up your time. It's really important to share our experiences and share the new tools. And we can see from the chat function, it's been highly appreciated. So really a big thanks to, the, to the, all the panelists. Thank you to Juliana from the Pacific Institute for organizing this. Uh, a big success, great attendance, really appreciate that. And for everybody attending and engaging in the chat functions, it's been a really, really an, a lively session. I would like just to emphasize that it has been recorded. So the, the, the link to the recording will be sent out, I think, tomorrow. So you can share that with colleagues and, uh, and uh, listen to other bits that you perhaps didn't catch. And also there'll be a satisfaction survey going out. So if you did have time to uh, fill out that, that would be really grateful. So once again, thank you to everybody for joining. It's been a really interesting session and I really appreciate that. Thank you again and we'll close there.